The other day I was working with a client and I was reviewing the Roth conversion strategy and the client asked a great question. He said, what's the break even point on a Roth conversion? And that's a great question because one of the challenges in doing a Roth conversion is you have to pay significantly more tax upfront and it takes a while before you're going to recoup back that money with future tax savings. And so the question was, how long does it take for me to break even on that Roth conversion? So today I'm gonna to show you how you can calculate that break even using right capital. And I'm gonna show you why a simple break even point is not the only thing that you should consider. But first, my name is Kevin Lum. I'm a certified financial planner, and this channel is dedicated to helping a million people retire without worry. So before I explore how you can calculate the break-even point, let me just give you a very brief overview of the mechanics of a Roth conversion. For most of us, for the past 30 years, we've been paying into a tax-deferred qualified account. Think traditional IRA, 401k, 403b, TSP, and there's a variety of other accounts. And so we pay money into those accounts and we get a tax deduction today. The money has been growing tax-free for the past 30 years, and now we have a significant amount of money in these tax-deferred accounts. And as many of us are realizing, when we go to take that money out, it can push us into a higher tax bracket. So a lot of people either in retirement or preparing for retirement are trying to figure out what's the best strategy for managing this giant pile of money. And one of the best ways to significantly reduce your long-term tax burden is by doing a Roth conversion. That's where you take money from your traditional IRA, you convert it to a Roth IRA, and you pay tax on that amount today, but you'll never pay any tax in the future, no matter how large the account grows. And so for a lot of people, including financial advisors, Roth conversions are a very compelling strategy, partially because it allows you to control what tax bracket you withdraw money at. So you can do your planning and say, look, I'm gonna to convert to the top of the 24% tax bracket. I have a million dollars in qualified accounts. I'm gonna convert $200,000 a year over the next five years. And if you have no other income coming in, it's very possible you'll pay almost no more taxes for the rest of your retirement. So you have five years of a high tax bill, but then you'll avoid taxing your social security potentially. You'll avoid the IRMA surcharges and the money in the Roth IRA is now gonna grow tax-free and you can either use it tax-free or it can pass to your heirs tax-free. And when you run the calculations and many of you have used Right Capital to run these calculations and if you haven't, I will put a link in the description where you can create your own account and play with this yourself. But when you run the calculation, you'll often find that you can save a million to $2 million in taxes over the life of the portfolio. And so a lot of people get really excited, but the downside is you have to pay significantly more money upfront in taxes, and that's money that is no longer going to be invested because you just took two, $300,000 to pay the government in taxes. And so that is two to $300,000 less that you have to invest. And so when you are figuring out whether you should do a Roth conversion, you have to look not only at the amount of money that you're gonna save in taxes, but you also have to look at the impact on the long-term value of the portfolio and balance are the conversions worthwhile. So now returning back to the question at the beginning of the episode, how do I calculate the break even on a Roth conversion? And so today I wanna to go back to Right Capital and I wanna walk through a case study of how you might be able to calculate the break even point and why it's not the only thing you should consider. So here we are looking at Phil and Claire Dunphy again. We've looked at them a lot. And at first glance, it seems that they are a perfect candidate to do a Roth conversion. They have about $5,000 a month in social security income that will kick on at age 70. They have a 97% probability of success. They have a million dollars in a tax deferred account. They're invested pretty aggressively and they have about $300,000 in the bank or high yield savings accounts that can help pay for the conversions. And so just at first glance, they seem like they would be great candidates to do a Roth conversion. So now let's go to the tax center. So here we can see that if Phil and Claire convert to the top of the 12% tax bracket, they should be able to have about a million dollars more in tax adjusted assets and save about $900,000 in taxes and pull out 2.4 million less from their tax deferred accounts because they don't have to take the RMDs when the money is inside the Roth IRA. And so they're one of the people that are perfect candidates to do a Roth conversion. Now we could play with this more, we could try a number of different variations out, but let's just stick with the 12% tax bracket. Now one thing I wanna come do here is remove the terminal tax rate. So if they don't have any errors, the money's gonna to go to charity or it's not gonna to go to family members. Let's see if it reduces the impact of the conversion. And 
it does actually impact the conversion a little bit. The tax adjusted ending assets is about half as much. So as you noticed, they still saved about a million dollars in taxes, but because their heirs aren't getting the money tax free, it doesn't have quite as much of an impact. Then the next question is, what's the break even point? Particularly if there's no heirs that the money is going to, how long do they have to live before it makes sense to do Roth conversions? So let's go to the retirement tab. And I have it on here where I can actually adjust their life expectancy. So I'm gonna make um, Phil's life expectancy be 88, and I'm gonna make Claire's life expectancy be 91. And let's refresh. And th basically this is just trial and error. You might have to actually go over to calculate this. Uh, you may not have that slider, and so you'll just have to go in and manually adjust their, their birth dates or their uh, life expectancy in the profile tab. So now let's look back at the tax strategy. And what we'll see is that that seems to be the right break even point. So Phil needs to live to about age 88 and Claire needs to live to about age 91 for the break even point if there are no heirs. And so one thing I should note, while the, the break even point seems to be 88 for Phil, 91 for Claire, on the tax adjusted ending assets, they still save almost a half million dollars in taxes. And one of the things you have to consider when you're doing a Roth conversion is, are we solving for the least amount of taxes or are we, are we solving for the largest pile of tax adjusted money? So we could come back over here and play with it a little bit and see what if they only live to, let's do 80 for Phil and 83 for Claire. And let's go back to the tax tab. So while there is significantly less tax adjusted ending assets, that does appear to be about the break even point on the taxes paid. So they need to live to about age 80 from a tax perspective and about age 90 for the tax adjusted ending assets perspective. Now, of course, this doesn't take into account having any errors. So let's go back up to the top of the 22% tax bracket. Now there's a different break even point, right? And we've got to go play with it again. The other thing you need to notice is, so let's take this off here. Um, let's go back down to zero. And then let's have, as often happens, one spouse lives significantly longer than the other spouse. So Phil passes at age 80, but Claire lives to age 95. So come back over here. We can see that now they again save about a million dollars in taxes. And that doesn't even take into account any terminal tax rate. If we then adjust up the terminal tax rate and adjust it, there's 1.2, almost 1.3 in tax adjusted portfolio. Now, if you remember, if Phil had lived in 92 and Claire had lived in 95, we still have Claire living until age 95. This number was actually lower, and part of that is because of the widow's penalty. And I have an entire video that I will link to at the end on the widow's penalty. Okay, I'm gonna leave the case study there. I'll put a link in the show notes uh, in case you wanna play with this yourself. But Roth conversions are complicated, and there's a lot of variables that you need to consider. You need to consider not only your life expectancy, you also need to consider the assets. How is the money invested? How quickly is, is it growing? Both today's tax rates and future tax rates, today's tax bracket and future tax brackets, a lot of that information is simply unknowable. We don't really know what the future tax brackets are going to look like. And then it's also about the, your heirs, whoever's gonna inherit your money, what their tax bracket is going to be. And you have no idea what that number is going to be. And so there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables that you have to sort through when you're making a Roth conversion. For many people, doing a Roth conversion is gonna save you a significant amount of money in taxes over the course of your life, but it's gonna take you a few years to recoup that tax savings. And there's something really psychologically hard about paying more in taxes today than you're required to, to save taxes in the future. In fact, that's part of how we got into this situation in the first place, is we took the tax deduction 30 years ago, and then that money grew tax-free for nearly 30 years, and now we've got a tax problem. I'm gonna leave it there. I hope this was helpful. As you were watching this, if you were a bit overwhelmed and you don't have a financial advisor, I would be honored if you'd consider working with me. There is a link in the show notes that will give you a bit more information on that. And finally, this is the end, I promise. But if you heard me mention the widow's penalty or the widower's penalty and you're like, what in the world is he talking about? I've got a whole video that explains it here.